God and his protection and his hand and bringing you back um, here to the United States from Malawi for some, for some respite and a furlough time. So we are so excited to connect with you and, and glad to have you back. Um, also, we wanted to give you guys a heads up that our ministry leaders and our life group leaders are also paying attention to comments and looking to touch base. So if you have a prayer request or you got issues, or especially if you're new, let us know. Comment, hey, I'm new, or hey, I got issues, and one of us will get in touch with you during service and even afterwards. Um, we just have a great um, heart for you guys and want to hear what you have to say. Um, as well, make sure you like and follow us on Facebook. Share with your friends. We are not afraid to have the world hear what we're bringing to the table, so we would love to have you guys share and extend the hope and joy that we try to bring you on Sunday mornings. Um, feel free also, Ron, our good brother Ron back there, has been working quite a bit on some updates on the website, elstonfamily.org. Um, so you can have links to our Facebook Lives for church, also for a Celebrate Recovery on Fridays, and other updates. So there also includes online giving, ways to connect with us, all of those important detail information that I could not like share without going 15 minutes long right now. So please check out our website, elsonfamily.org, and stay connected. We love you, we miss you, and we can't wait to see you again face-to-face. -face. Good morning, church. I'd like to introduce to you to my right, Joey Wright. And Joey is from Faith, North End Ministries. Actually served as an intern here in 2012. So we've all grown up a little bit since then. Joey, take it away. Well, good morning. I hope that you're finding that your heart is filled with joy this morning. But I think if we are honest, that most of us, if not all of us, uh, sometimes we are lacking in a little bit of joy. And we tend to uh, start to be drained of that throughout the week, which is part of the reason why we gather every Sunday morning to sing. And I wanted to remind us of a verse from Philippians 4 uh, that I was reminded of this week when I woke up and I just was not feeling it. I was short with my children. I was short with my wife. And the Holy Spirit brought Philippians 4, 4 to my mind. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Or in the NLT, it says, always have your heart full of joy in the Lord. The key to that is it's not about the circumstances. He's not saying rejoice in your circumstances because when I look at my bank account, it's not always the way I want it to look. When, I, when, I'm, uh, uh, when I'm talking with my children, they're not always responding the way that I want. Or my wife or everybody around me, the circumstances around us don't exactly go the way that we want. But Paul is saying, your joy is in the Lord, knowing God, knowing his truth, what he has done, his goodness, and what he promises to do. That is where we find it. So I want to remind us that as we sing this morning, we're going to start off by a song called Graves in the Gardens. I hope that it will bring joy back into your hearts and fill you this morning as we sing out so sing out in your living rooms wherever you're at uh, we're going to fill this room here uh, with joy and praise for our God let's sing together here we go I searched the world but he couldn't fail me Man's empty praise, pleasures of fame are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Sing out. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, using 
seal it, whether we see it or not. You're always working for our good. As Romans 28, 28 says, you use everything, good and bad circumstances, for the good of those who love you. 
You're constantly chasing us with your goodness and your mercy. Help us to trust that this morning. Help us to realign our hearts, recalibrate our hearts to the truth of your promises. And as we worship you, I pray that you would be blessed. Amen. Let's sing it together. Sure. 
Running out to, running out to me, I get there. 
in every situation and every trial knocks at the door of that truth is he good I was praying this morning and the whole Lord's prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and that phrase not my will but yours let your kingdom come let your will be done he prayed that at the cross not my will but yours I, I don't want to face this but but your will and I tell you what, I'm just having to rehearse this over and over, and I'm sure you are too. Not to lean into my own understanding, but grab a hold of the sovereignty of God. That He is good, He is faithful, He is true, and He will see us through. Church, we're praying, we're believing. God's going to bring us back together in some shape, form very soon. Don't know what that's going to look like. But until such a time, grab a hold of the goodness of God. Every day, His mercies are new. Every day there's this outpouring, a river from heaven that flows down of his goodness, his faithfulness, his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his redeeming mercy. Don't ever let go of that because that's what will get you through. Amen. All right, Brother Ron, take us on. All right, guys, you can have a seat. Relax at home as we get ready for the end of James chapter 3. Uh, last week we, we started it and we'll go over some of our uh, points here soon and kind of refresh what we talked about last week. But uh, we always want to start off with just welcoming you and letting you know how thankful we are that um, we get a chance to talk to you a little bit this morning and maybe influence where you're at and, and be able to worship with you. So uh, if if you're checking us out for the first time, I want to say go ahead and let us know in the comments. Go ahead and just comment first time. Let us know that uh, we're able to connect with you. Uh, if you would like, if you have any prayer requests, just let us know. And uh, we would love to contact you and, and communicate with you and just make a connection. Um, for those of us who are regular church attendees here at Elson Family Church, I want you to let us know um, where you are watching from this morning. Let us know if you are happening to be in a different place than normal. I know we have extended family watching. I know we have people all over who are connected to this church in some kind of way, but are kind of spread out throughout the country. So let us know where you're watching from this morning. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you a chance as you're commenting to turn to James chapter 3. Like I said, we're going to finish that out this morning. So go ahead and turn to James chapter 3. Um. While you're getting there, I'm going to kind of sum up a little bit of what we were talking about the last couple of weeks with this. So first off, one of the things that we, lear we learned in uh, James last week was that we have to be careful about how much influence we seek to have. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be going out of our way to seek any kind of importance because those who have influence will be judged much, much more strictly. Um, second, one of the things we looked at was that our words have the power of both life and death. Yet so many times we take it for granted. You know, we have the chance to speak life over each other. We have the chance to speak life into our relationships, into our church, into our work relationships. Wherever it is, whatever connections you have, you have an opportunity to speak life into that and hopefully influence that for the kingdom, influence that for God. You know, it's something I just thought of too, Ron, is not only speaking life over those things, but speaking life into our circumstances and situations. And I think sometimes we think, well, I can't, I can't change that. And you're right, I can't. But speaking life makes the perspective different. Sure. You see the glass half full, you see it half empty, whichever way you're speaking into that situation. Absolutely. Let it cripple you or let it be an opportunity. Absolutely. Um, 
third, the, the th third and final thing that we learned last week and that we talked about last week was that we offend God when we talk out of both sides of our mouth. Hmm. Whenever we praise him on Sunday morning and we say nice things on Sunday morning and we sing nice songs on Sunday morning and then throughout the week we're saying negative things and we're condemning people who are ultimately made in his image. And we ultimately are devaluing God because we're devaluing his image. Hmm. So with all that in mind, that would be enough for us to chew on and really just leave it there and say, cool, we got enough out of James yeah, 3. Right. Get us out of this book. Yeah, let's go somewhere else. Right. But um, luckily, I think it does uh, get a little more encouraging from here. That is, that is pretty hard. It's a, it's a harsh message for us to kind of chew on and swallow and get used to. But the fact of the matter is, is that James doesn't leave it right there. And he kind of goes into this moment of helping us realize that it really is more about the opportunity to speak positive words rather than it's about not speaking negative words. I'll explain that a little more here. Um, let's go ahead and move into verses 11 and 12. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Again, James is kind of pointing out that fact that, you know, we all kind of meet here on Sunday mornings whenever we're able to. We're all kind of connecting on Sunday mornings still. We have these little cliques and these little relationship circles that we build mm -hmm. in our Christian culture. And we kind of talk out of both sides of our mouth. And, and the fact that our church does that as a whole, we not just Elston Family Church, but the Christian community as a whole, we've become a spring that's not offering fresh water. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's detrimental because there's never been a time more than right now where mm -hmm. people could use a cool, fresh, encouraging sip of, of what we have to offer. Right. He closes out this whole chapter after reminding us this point by reframing everything that he just said. Everything that we talked about last week, he kind of refocuses his view on that. He doesn't change it. And it might, if, if you read it kind of flippantly, it might sound like he says something that just kind of undoes everything that he just said, but he's not doing that. He's trying to refocus how you see what he just said. So I'm actually going to read the rest of this in the message because I love again, how simple it is and how clearly he speaks here. Pick up in verses 13. He says, look church, do you want to be counted wise? Remember, we started talking at the beginning of the chapter right. about seeking influence and seeking to kind of be somebody important. He says, do you, want, do you want to be counted wise to build a reputation on being, or uh, to build a reputation for wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way that you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Now, if we didn't really catch what he was saying here, if we just read over this real quickly as if it were a um, challenge to, you know, got to get through this chapter by the end of the day so that way we can meet our quota and be through the Bible by the end of the year. <laughs> if you do it like that, you can completely miss what he's saying here. He's reframing how we look at what we say. He goes on, mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Saying, don't just try to say the right things to sound good. Don't try to worry about sounding smart or sounding holy. He said, twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's animal cunning, <laughs> devilish conniving. Oh, wow. Make sure you catch this, church. If you focus on not saying four-letter words, then you've completely missed his point. Now, there are plenty of texts in the Bible to justify the rule that we need to not have any foul language. But this isn't that text. That's not what he's saying here. He goes on, Whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, 
things fall apart, and everyone ends up at each other's throats. <laughs> now, see, this is where faith, this is where what the Bible tells us to do begins to completely clash with everything that's natural to us. Right. You know, our culture teaches us the exact opposite of this. Culture says, you claw your way to the top. You mow through everybody you have to. You don't let anybody get in your way between you and your goal. What James is saying here is that that's not what we need to be doing. And this isn't natural for us. You know, how many times have we ever been at a job and we heard, hey, I'm here to make money, not friends. <laughs> and that dude may not be like the nicest guy to work with, but more often than not, those are the coworkers that we have because that's natural to us. Right, right. Babies don't come out of the womb willing to share and saying, yes, mommy, no, mommy, and speaking holy, heavenly words of praise. We have to teach them to share. Right, we have sure. to teach them to play well with others. That's not our nature. But what James is doing is he's bringing this back and he's saying, not only is your secular culture, who you are at work, who you are outside of these four walls on Sunday morning, who you are outside of these circles of your church groups, not only does this go against what God ultimately wants you to do, but your church culture has done that too. Remember, he just said, we do one thing on Sunday mornings, we speak one way on Sunday mornings, and we speak another way throughout the week. What James is saying here is that it's really, really hard to do what we're supposed to with our words. For sure. Secular culture doesn't have it down, and church culture doesn't have it down. And real quick, before we move on, I just want to make one... Uh, important clarification. He says selfish ambition. Ambition itself is a good thing. Right. Ambition starts churches. It starts ministries. Ambition says, I want to do something great for God so that people can see how good he is. But selfish ambition says, this is my church. This is my ministry. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to be great so everyone sees how good I yeah, am. I There's a big glory. difference. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference there. James is saying, ultimately... What culture has taught you, whether it's secular culture or it's your church culture, whichever one you lean into more, it's wrong. So let's take that framework and go back over these few lessons that we pulled out of the first half of the chapter. He didn't explain away everything that he said by saying it's what you, how you live that matters, not what you say. He didn't explain it away. These are in, in tandem. They're in partnership. So let's look at this framework and put this back over the lessons that we learned. First, don't seek influence. Don't try to look wise. What he's saying here is if you want to be considered wise, if you want to be wise, church, then walk in wisdom. Seek to be humble. Live in a way that honors God. Your focus should lead your words, not the other way around. Hmm. Don't try to sound holy. Don't try to convince people that you've got it together. Allow God to work on you and your words will follow. That's good. He goes on. Second, our words have the power of both life and death. And yet so many times we take it for granted. Basing that off of this, when he says that our church culture doesn't even get it right, it makes me think he's saying, what would our churches look like? If we got this right, what would the world look like if the church was able to speak words of encouragement, if they were able to speak correction, but in a humble, gentle way, regularly, if they were able to speak honesty with each other, if they were able to build each other up on a regular basis, how different would our culture look? Mm -hmm. And then third, the negative words we speak say a whole lot more about us than they do anybody else. And ultimately, we're offending God when we speak negatively about others. When we bounce that off of this, what we start to see is that not only is that talking about the secular world, but that's also talking about us here in the church. Mm -hmm. 
See, when we're doing everything we can to try to sound wise, when we're doing everything we can to try to sound smart and sound like we got it all together, ultimately, we're fighting our own hidden agendas and we all end up at each other's throats. So as we close out this chapter, I want to highlight something. I think, it's, I think it's absolutely true that all of us who are saved genuinely want to be great for God. They, sure. We all want to do something for God. We want to do what he's called us to do. And I think that's because obviously the Holy Spirit lives in us and it's kind of an outworking of what Jesus told the woman at the well, the water that I give you will quench your thirst and it will inside of you turn into a well, welling up to eternal life. Other people will want to drink the water because you're carrying it around. Right. But it's much harder to do that than it is to talk about it. See, it's really easy to say the right things, but it's a lot harder to live out what you're saying. What he's saying here is, yes, your words absolutely matter. You have the power of life and death in your mouth. But if you just have that, if you just have the good words, then you're missing something. You're missing the whole purpose of speaking those positive words, the whole purpose that we have. So what is that purpose? Well, he closes it out with the same verse that we started at the beginning with. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. It is gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings. It's not hot one day and cold the next. It's not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoys its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other and treating each other with dignity and honor. Paul put it this way in Hebrews uh, 20, or 10, 24. He said, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. What is our purpose as a church? What is our calling? One, obviously to glorify God, but how do we do that? Dig into it a little deeper. And it's by having a ministry of reconciliation, mm -hmm. bringing the hurt to the healer, bringing mm -hmm. the hopeless to hope. Now, we, we can say the nice things on Sunday morning, but ultimately, if we're not living those nice things out, we're missing our whole purpose as believers. One of the things that made this verse, made this chapter so real for me was an experience that I had in my life. Before getting into recovery and um, getting right with God and, and really coming back to him and accepting my calling, when I was still running from my calling, um, as a lot of you know, a lot of you who know my story, um, I was not a particularly savory person. Um, I lived in a two-bedroom apartment with eight other guys. We were all addicts. It was not a particularly good time. That being said, I was blessed to have who is my wife now in my life then, and her father came up to meet her daughter's new boyfriend one time and whenever he was there he had absolutely no reason to trust me with his daughter he saw the way we were living he saw where I was living he saw the person I was he saw the people I hung out with and he had absolutely no reason to trust me but there was a huge huge change in my life at the end of that visit at the end of that visit, he took me outside and he said, you want to come outside and talk to me for a second? Mm. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> not really. Right. And, uh, you know, I was ready for the whole, like, intimidation thing because, again, I was not a particularly savory person then. And all that never worked with me. 
with any of my ex's fathers, you know, trying to intimidate me. That never worked. What I was not ready for was what he did. He sat me down on the back of his truck and he said, look, man, you're a good guy. I can feel it in your handshake and I see it in your eyes. Hmm. You're not like the rest of those knuckleheads up there. Look, man, I live eight hours away. If you do end up doing something to my daughter, there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm asking you, one good man to another, will you make a change? Wow. And he spoke life into me. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time that God had whispered in my ear in a long time. And it was the beginning of, okay, it's time to come home. Mm-hmm. It's time to start working on yourself. It's time to get into recovery. It's time to accept your calling. I'm not going anywhere. Your calling's not going anywhere. That was the beginning of my recovery. Words. That wasn't somebody who was just saying the right things. That wasn't somebody mm-hmm. who was just trying to speak Christianese. It was coming out of a lifestyle. A lifestyle that understood that even though things may not have looked the greatest on the outside, he recognized that I was not who I wanted to be, nor mm-hmm. was I who God created me to be. Right. I'm going to close powerful. out with one last story that, again, kind of talks about how important it is for us to be this community that is, is healthy and robust, that speaks words of encouragement into each other. There was a pastor about 20-something years ago whose life was almost changed forever. He was a newer Christian when he got saved. Obviously, he was kind of new to the faith like everybody is at first, but he didn't really have anybody to disciple him. His family weren't weren't particularly believers. He was kind of on his own. And not only that, he was getting saved in the middle of his frat guy, heavy drinking, partying lifestyle. But once he got saved, he immediately realized that God was asking him to do something. So he started a Bible study on his campus and ended up turning into a huge Bible study. A lot of people met Jesus through it. It was was really, really blessed. And he realized at the end of that, you know, maybe God's calling me to do this full time. Maybe, Maybe he's calling me to be a preacher. So when he accepted his calling, he started preaching at his church, and it was a little Methodist church around our size. For those of you not familiar with our church, it's about 150 people. And the first time he preached, he was so nervous. Mm. He kept losing his spot in his notes. He kept repeating the same things over and over. He was stumbling on his words. And after what had felt like an eternity to him, he finally finished up, and he said the closing prayer. Then he went to the back of the room to shake everybody's hands as they all left. And the last person to leave was an older lady in the church. She was kind of a staple member of the church. She had a lot of influence. What she said mattered a lot. She shook his hand, looked him square in the eye, and said, you need to find something new to do. You'll never be a preacher. (laughs) Wow. Now, this shook him to the core. It's kind of funny to listen to, but it wouldn't be funny if you were him. Right. And it shook him so much that he decided that day he was going to quit preaching. He said, this is all a delusional dream. Why would God ever use me? Why why would anybody listen to me? You know, I'm, I'm so messed up as it is. Why did I ever think that this could be something that God wants to use me to do? Now, luckily, he had some people in his life who were fighting fire with fire (laughs) and were speaking words of affirmation into his life, speaking life into him. So he continued to preach. Now, quick question, side note. Um, go ahead and let us know in the comments if you used the Version Bible app this morning to follow along with the sermon. How many in here, did any of y'all use the Bible app? Awesome. Well, you could thank the people in this young man's life who spoke life into him and kept him preaching because he grew up to become Pastor Craig Rochelle. Wow. 
And if you don't know who Pastor Craig Rochelle is, <laughs> he's the senior and founding pastor of Life Church, the single largest evangelical church in our country. Not only are they the single most influential evangelical church in our country, but they decided to create the YouVersion Bible app because they wanted everyone to have free access to God's word. Now, because of this app, it offers 1,797 versions of the Bible in over 1,200 languages, making God's word the most accessible to every tribe, every tongue, and every nation that it has ever been in the past. I'll let that sink in for a second. What if he had done like a lot of church members do and got hurt and just left the church? What if he didn't have somebody there to speak life into him? And see, this lady was an influential pe person in the church. Mm. What she said held a lot of weight. Our words matter. They do. But it's not just saying the right things. It's the heart that they're coming out of. Are you living the life that is spurring someone on to love and good deeds? Are you spurring someone on to grow up to become a Craig Rochelle mm -hmm. that makes the word more available than it has ever been in history? Or are you being somebody who at one point in time might have to be responsible for standing in front of God and saying, oh yeah, I stopped him, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. It's all about how we live. The words are a part of that. Speaking life into the community is our calling. Reconciliation is our ministry. We are to be, like we talked about last week, hope dealers, world shakers, culture changers, with our words and the way we live. The smallest thing you know, the other day when we ordered some delivery, we put down in the direction notes, the driver direction notes, mm -hmm. we just said, hey, man, thank you so much for what you're doing. We don't want to be out there, and, and you're risking yourself to make it safer for us. Thank you so much. And when he got there, he about cried. Hmm. And that didn't take us but 30 seconds to throw on there. That really wasn't that big a deal for us, but that small little bit of life was what he needed to hear. That is our ministry. More than anything else we do, that is our ministry. Amen. You know, and just not trying to do anything more than maybe just put a tag in here. I, this phrase has cir circulated through our church for several years, and one of our elders said it, and I don't know that he originally got it, but somebody has through the past made this statement powerful. Uh, intention versus impact. And, you know, all too often with our words, we didn't intend for them to go the way they did. But the impact was that they did do either the damage or uh, whatever. And I think even that, you know, again, I go back to just even how we view our own lives and view our own circumstances, intention versus impact. Um, all too often we curse ourselves and we, we, we corner ourselves. And I remember starting in this church 20 years ago and... Um, it has to go way back past to when I was a teenager in this church, long before I started pastoring, that there were old ladies around here. I don't mean that disrespectfully, but old ladies who said, "I ah, one of these days, you're going to be a preacher. You're, you're going to be a preacher. You're going to preach and probably preach in this church. And I'm like, yeah, right. Um, you know, the impact of those words just kept playing through my life. They just kept speaking to my life when I was running as well, when I was avoiding the call. And it just kept coming back. You know, you're going to be, you're going to be this, you're going to be that. And I could not see myself because I cursed myself and my situations all too often with my own self-loathing. You know. Sure. But um, I think just in closing, folks uh, in church, we just need to recognize there's an impact. There's a powerful impact with what we say. And again, when it's backed up with a life of love and grace and mercy, God can do all kinds of things 
through our lives as we just become a vessel and a conduit of his love and his grace. I'm going to ask Joey to come back up in our worship team, and we're going to close out with a song, um, Yes, I Will. We did it last week, but it just seems to fit in this moment of acknowledging God's sovereignty and being, being fully committed and submitted to his purposes, his words, his truth. And um, in spite of, again, I know this sounds like a broken record, but in spite of what we're facing and in spite of what we're dealing with, I will still praise you. I will still praise you. Read through the Psalms often, and, and Psalm 103 always circulates it back around every so often in the month. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not the one who has forgiven me. Forget not the one who has healed me. Forget not the one who has delivered me and set me free. Bless the Lord. Regardless of where I am, blessing and praising the Lord because he's worthy. Church, I'm going to pray you out. Uh, I want to encourage you, uh, shoot to the website, elstonfamily.org. Uh, continue to just keep meeting with us, Facebook Live, on, on Friday nights as well as Sunday mornings, Friday nights at 7. Uh, uh, CR uh, comes on live. Uh, join us again next week and uh, next Friday at 7. For CR next Sunday at 10, we'd, lo we'd love to hear from you. Please use the platform of comments, use the platform of the email, elstonfamily at elstonfamily.org uh, to just touch base with us. Uh, just love dealing with you guys in this way because it's the only way we got. So we appreciate you just connecting with us. Don't sit at home in a hole letting the enemy beat you up. If you're struggling, reach out to us. Reach out to us. We'll talk to you. We're not afraid to talk over the phone. Not afraid to go to your door and stand on the other side of the screen if we have to. We love you, church. God bless you. I'm going to pray you out, and then Joy's going to lead us out in this uh, last song. Thanks, Joy, for being here. Man, it's hard to believe it's been eight or nine years since you've been here. <laughs> you've got had hair the last time I was here. I, you know what? I was going to say something along that line, but I hate it when people say that to me, so I wasn't <laughs> going to throw it back in your lap. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. Thank you for your goodness. Your goodness that runs after and pursues us. That's the amazing thing. You pursue us. Yet while we were still sinners, Christ died. We love you. Thank you. Praise you. Amen. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God that never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high. Always found me, yes, I will bless your name, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is empty all my days. Oh, yes, I same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I choose to praise, to praise.
You can stay if you want to for a few minutes, but we're going to go back and do Graves in the Gardens. This was a good song that Joy brought to us. I hadn't heard it before, but now it's become one of my top favorites. If you want to stay on, you can. If your kids got to get lunch or a snack or you got to go to the bathroom, we understand. But we're going to do this last song. I know sometimes that's the way it happens around here, right? We close it, then I change it. Here we go. Let's sing it out. I searched the world, but he couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise, pleasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied Here in love oh, 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 there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. There's the God of the mountain, He's the God of the valley. It's not a place, you're my secret grace, won't find me again. Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing. shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn morning to dancing you 
Oh! 